Well, hey, Sullivan, good to have you in the studio. Our brand new studio here in France. And are you impressed? Yeah, no, it's very nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We've growing up here at Biz News, and yeah. uh, you've been with us the journey all the way through. Also, you've been on the journey with the Zondo Commission, and now we have part one of the reports from the Zondo Commission. As an overview, your thoughts? Well, so far so good. Um, you know the way it's coming out. You're seeing SAA, so it vindicates my actions against Duda Mayani although I don't get mentioned in the report, I think... Um, Did you actually make a submission? To oh, yeah. We made a very detailed submission. Um, and then we applied to cross-examine some of the witnesses. And at one stage, they were talking about, um, you know, that I would go and give evidence. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, they announced that the criminal justice system is no longer part of their mandate. So they won't be reporting on the criminal justice system. And that for me was a problem because had they have recognized the fact that state capture was only possible after the capture of the criminal justice system, they would have realized that the capture of the criminal justice system was one of the enabling factors. And I mean, if you had good cops and good prosecutors in situ, uh, state capture couldn't have happened. The people would have been arrested and charged. So that's a real big problem for me. We've got letters on file from the Sondo Commission um, denying my request, my application, formal application, uh, to cross-examine certain witnesses. I wanted to cross-examine uh, a number of witnesses. Who in particular? Uh, I wanted to cross-examine uh, Duda Mayani. I want to cross-examine... Well, you would have come just as short as everybody else there because yeah, she I, certainly didn't well, want yeah, to Well, yeah, except share. I would have wiped the floor with her. How? Um, eh? How? Well, I would have made allegations to her and she would have had to, uh, to, to use her expression, quote the Fifth Amendment, you know, uh, the right to remain silent. Uh, I wanted to... Uh, there were a number of people within the NPA and the police who got up there and lied through their teeth or produced affidavits which they submitted in terms of which they lied through their teeth. And those people belong in prison. And some of them are still in their jobs within the NPA and the police. That's interesting. So there were certain people who committed perjury at the Zondo Commission yeah. where you have to speak under oath. Yeah. Can yeah. they go to jail for that? Well, they can go to jail for what they what they spoke about because they lied through their t apart from the perjury they committed at the Sondo Commission and I mean the problem is the Sondo Commission has come to an end now and if they start prosecuting all the people that lied that's going to be another 15 or 20 years in court. Uh, You've got a good uh, approach to that Paul in other words don't try and get them on a thousand counts find yeah. uh, uh, the ones that will stick just, yeah. just unpack that for us. Okay it goes back to a case I dealt with many many years ago um, it was a guy that convicted of uh, fraud, a very big scale fraud in those days, going back to the early 90s. Um, and then another case I dealt with after that. But this particular case of fraud, I was in the police then. We charged a guy with, it took me three months to write the charge sheet, 1,898 charges, 112 <laughs> charges short of 2,000 took me three months to write the charge sheet, and the charge sheet comprised three lever arch files. And That's just the charge sheet, in yeah, other words, what yeah, he's done yeah, wrong. Yeah, he's a very bad guy. He stole from pensioners, you know. He stole a lot of money. His name is Andre Bauer. And he had all these re retirement villages, uh, which I actually rescued. Um, I used my own cash to rescue uh, those villages and bring, you know, bring the people to what they paid for, that they got what they paid for. Um, and what happened at the time was he was arrested and charged. I, th I think he was arrested in April of 1994. And he was kept behind bars for maybe three or four months, you know. And then he was released on bail. And then his trial continued. And his trial only ended in 1997 so it was like three, three, and a, years. three and a half years so it was towards the end of 97 and then he, he was sentenced to uh, about 300 and something years in prison 
because of all these charges. But the effect of all those charges, they have what they call the summing up rules, and they add them all together, and some are consecutive, some are concurrent, blah, blah, blah. And the net effect was he got 15 years in prison. And I was at the Rand Club with the prosecutor and the regional court magistrate who sentenced him. Obviously, that wasn't possible before he went on trial or during the trial. And we were sitting there at the Rand Club and we had a nice meal. And then I think I was just getting stuck into my sticky toffee pudding with custard when the regional magistrate came out with something like, of course, you realised if you'd have charged him with only 10 charges, he would have still got 15 years. And that made me think. And after that, uh, as a policeman, I used to just go for the low-hanging fruit. I'd go for the charges that were crisp and clean and could easily be proven in court. And I would abandon the other charges because what's the point in having a three-year trial if you can have a three-week trial and the guy will still get 10 years or 15 years? Whereas if you have a, a three-year trial, he's still going to get 10 years or 15 years. So my approach then was to say, forget all the other stuff, pick five charges. And the next case that I was involved in where we actually did just that was a bank manager by the name of Vito Asanti. He was the regional bank manager at Kempton Park of NBS Bank. And he assisted a lawyer and a building contractor to swipe about, I think it was about 375 million rand. And when I started drafting the charge sheet, I thought, oh, hang on a minute, you know, this, this trial can go on forever. They selected, eventually, the MPA selected five charges involving an amount of 50 million rand, you know, big checks for 20 and 10 and whatnot. And those five charges, he copped a plea on them. He realised that his game was over and he copped a plea. Now, there's another thing that's wrong with our criminal justice system. Um, I contracted between 2006 and 2009 with the, with the British government. I was working for the uh, Ministry of Justice in the UK. And we were looking at uh, reorganising the criminal legal aid system in the UK. And it ultimately came to the fact that there was, they have what they call sentencing rules in the UK. So if you're convicted of this type of category of an offence, there's a standard sentence you should get. Now, they should apply that here in South Africa because the way it works in the UK is if you plead guilty before the trial commences, you automatically get one third off the sentence that you would get if you pleaded not guilty and were convicted. So stop wasting everybody's time. Yes. You, you are, if you're guilty of something, yes. we'll incentivize yes. you to do that. You, so then if you are pleading not guilty, of course you have the right to plead not guilty, sure. but if you plead not guilty and the evidence against you, you are convicted. Remember, most of those sort of trials are jury system. So it's 12 good men and women, you know, and... That's the way it works. And if you are convicted, then the, the, the decision on sentencing has got nothing to do with the jury. And for most part, it's got nothing to do with the judge. He has a guideline that he has to follow. Now, if we had that sort of thing going on here, instead of getting 15 years, some of these people could cop a plea and go for 10 years or five years even. You know, I look at Duda Mayeni, for example. Apart from being a, a despicable woman... Uh, without a shred of honesty in her body, um, if she was to plead guilty to, for example, uh, contempt of court, uh, which is the offence she committed at the Zondo Commission, she named witness X, and she did that on purpose to intimidate the person, so she could also be charged there with intimidating that person or defeating the ends of justice. But if she was to cop a plea and go to jail for five years... I'm pretty sure the country would be happy whether she got five years or 10 years or 15 years. The important thing is they have to go to prison. And if they think they can escape jail, then that's another problem. And then there needs to be reparation. Um, and Sondo talks about reparation in the report. But the problem is the legislation 
uh, for reparations in South Africa also needs to be overhauled. There's lots of work to be done there, but the big story internationally on the Zondo Commission right now is Bain. Yes. The Financial Times of London who've run a l- number of stories on it, yes. including an editorial comment yes. where they are calling on Bain's customers or clients to around the them. world yeah. to ditch them. Yeah. In fact, that's I, unprecedented. I, in fact, I spoke to Peter about it, and you know, Peter's quite uh, vocal. Peter? Uh, Peter Hain. And uh, he's given them a good clobbering in the UK as well. And I, I think he's going to be asking for um, colleagues of his in the Houses of Parliament, because as you know, he's in the House of Lords. Um, he's going to be asking for colleagues to bring a motion to ban them from working for any government part, department um, in the UK. They're still working for government in South Africa, though, which well, is they an are. astonishing They need to situation. be fired everywhere. Um, and it's very easy for them to say they made a mistake, but actually they facilitated the hollowing out of, of SARS. Um, and they made a mistake because they were paid to make a mistake. Now that, in my opinion, amounts to corruption. Um, if you produce a report that says what the person paying for the report wants you to say, then you're involved in corruption. And you're leveraging your international brand yeah. to give it credibility. That's KPMG it. did... Well, KPMG did the same. And unfortunately with KPMG, um, you know, their report has been completely discredited. And the result of that is that some of what the work they did, you end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Um, because not 100% of everything in their report was fallacious. Some of it actually had merit. Um, I don't go into that right now, but some of the allegations they made had merit. And it was backed up with... Um, documentary evidence now the but the whole report has been thrown out of because course it has. they be- put because things in that yes, they shouldn't have they were uh what is it the the, the the he who pays the piper calls the tune and yeah. they were playing to the person that was calling the tune and uh, that's very unfortunate and of course kpmg are not alone but you've taken on big corporations, big organisations, very powerful organisations before, yeah. and, and as has uh, still Peter Haynes. Still, still do. What, what would you do if you were advising the South African government, or even SARS, on Bain? Because Bain has come back and said, well, in fact, they've been less than contrite, and suggesting that uh, the profits that were earned by their South African subsidiary were earned for good work. Well, you know, you have to look at what I call the management consultants. You know, there's a consultant gravy train around the world. Everybody needs a consultant to tell them what to do next. Um, and they've lost the plot. A lot, of, Not only governments, but big corporations as well are famous for hiring consultants to tell them what to do. I mean, if you turn the clock back, we go back to South African Airways. There was a chap running South African Airways by the name of Coleman Andrews. Now, Coleman Andrews' wife, was working for a management consultant company in America. Never. Serious? Yes, yes. I'm trying to remember their name now. It wasn't um, Bain. No, it wasn't Bain. <laughs> Otherwise you would have known in the um, top of your tongue. Was it McKinsey? The, the, the company in question changed its name. Uh, subsequently, you know, they became something management mm. consultants. No, they, they, it, the, the point being it was a management consultant. Management consultant who happened to be... One of their biggest clients was an aviation company, well-known aviation company, by the name of Boeing. And at the time, uh, when Coleman Andrews was running the show, South African Airways was busy with a tender for the replacement of its short haul fleet. So it was either going to be uh, A319s and 320s, or it was going to be uh, 737-800s. Of course, we guess who got the contract? We got, we got the 737-800s. Um, so, so a corruption in South Africa is nothing new. It's been going on for a long time, You, Coleman well, Andrews. But can the Zondo Commission... Well, I'm not saying Coleman was corrupt. I'm just saying, you know, there's a thin grey line corrupt. between a conflict of interests and corruption. Um, and, of course, if you ask Coleman today whether he was corrupt, of course he'll deny it. So we, I don't want to defame the guy. At the end of the day, he didn't do the right thing for South African Airways. Um, well, it was a slippery slope since then. But well, my point here is Zondo Commission. Yeah. 
now that it's it's come out with its findings yeah. and th- there's there's a lot of information to be sifted through yeah is this going to have an impact on corruption in south africa or indeed the kind of impact that we are hoping well obviously ultimately it has to have um but i'm i'm remain of the firm opinion that every person especially a, a person that was in a position of authority uh, whether he was a minister he or she whether they were a minister uh, whether they were ceo or cfo or chief operating officer of a state-owned entity i mean the ceo of sabc is infamous for what he did you know they, a lot of these people in order to pull off the stunts they pulled off they had to eviscerate their organizations clear out the management that were good and ethical and because otherwise they wouldn't get away with what they were doing so you end up with all these hollowed out state-owned entities and the people that are gone have left the vacuum and now these entities are supposed to be running on you know normal business lines meanwhile all their expertise is gone saa was a prime example uh, transnet sars praza sars you know a lot of these organized denal a lot of these organizations are, were hollowed out for purposes of corruption but the most important one was the criminal justice system because in hollowing out the criminal justice system they did two things first of all they ensured that the cops wouldn't catch the robbers because the cops were friends of the robbers and secondly anybody that stood on the on the hill and pointed at the robbers became targets and as you know i mean i was i my offices were raided multiple times i had um i was arrested several times um sarah jane trent uh, the the director of forensics for justice was kidnapped and hauled away for three days i was i was detained on one of the occasions i was detained i was tortured um and then eventually i had to go through seven trials and if you add all the charges together on the seven trials there were 65 charges now uh, of course i've been acquitted or or the cases were thrown out of court but the f- the fact is that was 3 years of my life actually more it was 4 years of my life uh down the drain they kept my passport so i couldn't go overseas to visit my family there was a lot of issues and the instantaneous justice that they tried to serve on me has to be contrasted with the fact that i opened my first criminal docket against myeni in march 2015 that's almost 7 years ago in january 2016 i opened a docket against her with prima facie evidence in it i should add in march 2016 i made a supplementary statement and added more prima facie prima facie evidence and in july 2016 i made another one and then in 2017 we opened a docket against Mayeni and Zuma for corruption so all those dockets have been sitting there all those years with prima facie evidence in and to give you a, an idea of the scale of things <clears throat> it took 4 and 1/2 years to build the cow train some of those dockets have been sitting there for 6 and 1/2 years the timeline is imp- interesting here because this is during the period when Jacob Zuma was the president of South Africa exactly. where the zuptas were at their zenith of yeah, power yeah, yeah. before the elective conference where Sir Ramaphosa at the in December 2017 when he was elected so they're all there you can almost understand that during a time when the president of the country is being potentially implicated in the dockets that you've opened yeah. that there would be no investigation well we but why the, not in the 5 years subsequent well, to that we what's the, going we, on now well you know um i wrote a letter a couple of weeks ago to shamila betawi um and she she responded saying that you know don't worry we're on to it we're dealing with it you know um what i've asked for is an assurance that they will go for the the low hanging fruit and it seems to be that there's an attitude or a policy in the npa that everybody must be charged with everything they did so going back to the how we started this yeah, conversation yeah i'm saying that's wrong because if you're going to do that the interest of justice won't be served you're going to end up with half a dozen people 
with long drawn out trials tying up the criminal justice system for the next 20 years. And that's, that is not in the interest of justice. I would be more than happy to see Dudu Maeni get slapped in jail for five years for defeating the ends of... Forget the corruption charges. That's, that's going to be a long trial to produce a... We've got a videotape of that woman sitting there naming Mr X. That's a criminal offence. Lock it up. Short and sweet. And the, bed, the sad thing, and I made the comment at the time, the sad thing is when she did that, there were policemen sitting in the room who should have They should arrested have arrested her? her immediately. Did they know that, uh, uh, would they have known excuse that it me, was a... These policemen know what they're doing. If the, 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 the Criminal Procedures Act makes it clear that a police officer can arrest any person that commits any offence in front of them. So the police don't have to investigate. If they're sitting there and they see her commit the offence, they can arrest her immediately. And I'm left wondering, why didn't they? Those cops should be hauled up and said, explain why you didn't arrest a woman. And I can tell you the answer. The answer is very simple. The criminal justice system was captured starting back in 2012, which was after Zuma came to power. A process endured to capture the whole of the criminal justice system. At one stage you had Jiba, the acting national director of public prosecutions. Then you had this clown, uh, corrupt clown at that, Sean the Sheep, um, who was illegally appointed in the first place. Michael Hulley appointed him. He never even met with Suma when Suma signed his appointment letter. He never even met, met him. And that was the head of the N NPA. Yeah. Paul, just, uh, just to uh, perhaps put that into perspective, we've had five years of a different government. Yeah. Well, we haven't had we five have years, have we? Almost. It, well, we've had four years. Four. Four. Uh, oh, four and a, uh, anyway. How far are we still down the rabbit hole? If we were at 100% captured during Zuma's uh, regime, where would we, we be sitting today? I don't know. I'd say we're still 50% captured. That doesn't mean 50% of all the cops and prosecutors are captured. I'm saying if one goes back to the level that we were at, when we were 100% captured... It didn't mean that every prosecutor was corrupt. It meant that the control... Just trying to get a feel for Well, it, I made yeah. the appointment to Godfrey Lebea. You know, he was appointed um, the head of the Hawks. And, I, you know, I've known Godfrey for, le for years and years and years. And I said to him in one email about a year after he was appointed, and I said, Godfrey, the problem now is that you are in charge of the Hawks, but you're not in control of the Hawks. And the same applies to the... Uh, National Prosecuting Authority. I told Shamila, I said, Shamila, you are in charge of the NPA, but you're not in control of the NPA. How long will it take for her to get into control well, now we, that she's uh, lost her right hand? I used, if you, you know, I used the expression sleeper cells. So during the period of state capture, while these people owned the criminal justice system, they appointed, unlawfully, they appointed a whole host of people into different positions within the orcs, within the police, within the NPA, within the secret services. So you've got all those people there. Now, how do you get rid of them? Do you go through disciplinary inquiries? Now, the problem is those people are part of the supply chain, if you like. They're part of this, this supply chain in delivering criminal justice. And how can you deliver criminal justice if you've got people pulling in the opposite direction? And that's what we have here. If I take a block of concrete that weighs 10 tons and I put it on the floor and I tie a rope to both sides of the concrete and I say, right, find out how many men you need to drag that concrete in that direction. Let's say east, you know. Right, 100 men. Good. Let's drag the concrete. Now the problem is 50 of those men run around to the other side and they pull the rope in the opposite direction. That concrete's going nowhere. So you actually need now 150 on the rope to go east to counter the 50 that are trying to pull west. And that's the same thing that's going on in the criminal justice system. I'll, I'll give you a classic example. We go and open criminal dockets on a regular basis. And sometimes for clients, you know, because we, I run a, a practice of fraud consultants. 
So we open dockets. Now you arrive at a police station at a front desk and maybe myself or Sarah Jane or one of my other staff who are all extremely highly qualified people arrive at a police station front desk with the client and a lever arch file being the docket and the cop behind the counter says no you can't open the docket like that you have to write it out by hand how do you write a hundred page affidavit with annexes of all the evidence where you've set out chapter and verse of how a fraud was committed how do you write that out by hand and that's the mentality we're dealing with and then you go to the station commander and eventually the station commander comes and tells him, okay, go register the docket. The problem, the mentality we have is there's currently no leadership in the police, no proper leadership, which filters from the top down to station level. And there you end up with guns going missing and they don't even know when they went missing because they haven't kept proper records so nobody knows oh uh, stock take is done oh there's 20 guns missing oh when were they stolen mm, i don't know well when did we last do the stock take okay two years ago right in the docket it says they were stolen between 19 uh, uh, 2018 and 2020. now how the hell can you not account for 20 guns over a period of two years is there any good news you can give us yeah i think the good news is that um we, we're winning slowly but surely I think what needs to happen is some, the, 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 I use the expression quick justice. What's missing in South Africa is quick justice. The only people that get quick justice are people like myself who go and open criminal dockets against Duda Mayeni. And then three weeks later, I'm uh, in a jail cell with handcuffs behind my back, uh, having a, a corrupt general in the police prodding me in the chest telling me you don't know how you've upset Duda Mayeni. Um, that's, that's quick justice of the wrong kind. We now need quick mm -hmm. justice of the right kind. And I'm hoping in the next report that Zondo issues, and I hope somewhere somebody listens and gives him the message, that he doesn't just refer uh, to the ex-CFO of South African Airways not having complied with Section 34.1, of the Prevention and Combating of Corrupt Activities Act. But I'm hoping he will name and shame every minister and every government senior employee who knew corruption was going on and didn't do anything about it. That's going to be a long report. Talking of which, you've got a book in the making. Yeah, it's it's coming out soon. Uh, we, ha we, we, well, it's, it's going to be in the shops before Easter. And it, it's going to be a cracker. No holy cows, as they say. You know, the problem we have over here, I go, if you look at our world, our world is compartmentalized. And a lot of people don't get justice when they deserve it. And the reason they don't get justice when they deserve it is because you have cliques, cliques that protect each other. Um, it's very hard to find a lawyer to help you sue a lawyer. It's very hard to find a doctor that will give evidence in a... Uh, a medical malpractice case against another doctor. And the same applies in, in the media. It's very hard to find uh, media who are prepared to criticize other media. Unless, of course, there's some sort of a, um, what shall we say, uh, animosity between the parties concerned. Um, for example, you see a lot of animosity at the moment, public animosity between Daily Maverick and IOL, you know, the, uh, what's his name? Um, Iqbal, Iqbal Survey. Iqbal, yeah, yeah, Iqbal Survey. Um, and of course, you know, the fact that Iqbal has uh, people uh, who should have had the name Hans Christian Andersen uh, <laughs> rather than Zilikazi wa Africa, uh, which, by the way, isn't his real name. We know his real name. We name him and shame him in our book. Uh, he lives a very wealthy lifestyle which is surprising because most journalists don't live a wealthy lifestyle. So when I see journalists who own 5 million rand houses and drive uh, 1 million rand cars, I always get suspicious. And there's a few of those in South Africa. And then you end up with uh, undercurrents because certain journalists or 
certain media houses have connections or shareholders or other connections which leaves you wondering well hang on a minute how can that how how can that be right you know like how can you report uh, without fear favor or prejudice in the public domain if you've got shareholders who are themselves connected to the criminal underworld and that that seems to be rife in i'm not suggesting Biz news has any such shareholders but there are certain organizations out there that are connected or if they're not connected they have been accused of certain criminal conduct uh, and here they are running media houses and i think that needs to to come out into the open and it does so in my book uh, i attack these media houses i also attack sanef who stood by and watched for eight years of state capture and did nothing allowed all these journalists and editors to get up there and bring the country to its knees by assisting state capture and yet when i start naming and shaming and threatening those journalists with exposure sanef jump out without speaking to me by the way not giving me the not applying the audi ultra partum rule which journalists are supposed to comply with uh, sanef issue a media release uh, criticizing me for threatening journalists and then they go and they appoint their own panel to do a whitewash report on the the involvement of the media in state capture you, you don't step back for anybody paul uh, where does I, this come well, from? I mean, you're now making more enemies because well, clearly I'm not making enemies. Mm, I'm just telling the truth. You, well, if you if and you if you take on media houses and accuse them of the things that you've just mentioned, now of course you're making enemies yes. and powerful enemies. Well, you know they may be. I'm just stating the truth. The problem is some of these media houses have been involved, and they need to come out and put. You know, if you go back to 2018, October 2018, actually September 2018, I gave. Sunday time, seven days to retract all those stories or face the music. What do they do? Seven days later, they retracted all the stories and they issued a front page apology. And the three stories I was talking about was the, uh, the, 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 the I call it the founding story of state capture, Zimbabwe rendition. Now, Zimbabwe rendition was intended to do nothing more or less than neutralize uh, the Hawks, the DPCI. It was to go after Mokateri, uh, sorry, after uh, uh, um, um, Anwar Dramat. Mm -hmm. Anwar Dramat, we'll come back to Boyson. Anwar Dramat and uh, the guy in um, in Gauteng. Yo, his memory slipped my mind now. He was ahead of. Um, Not Sitoli. No, no, no. Um, yeah, anyway, you know, it'll come back to me just now. And then. The next story was uh, the Cato Manor Death Squad, you know, which was another work of fiction. Oh, that was Boyson. That was Boyson. Mm -hmm. And then they, after they got all their, their conduct right on those two and got their thing going, uh, they, they, were on a, they were on a ride. So they decided, OK, while we're on a roll, uh, let's run another story and finish SARS off. And that was your SARS rogue unit. So those three stories we've linked to three journalists. We issued a report in December 2016 called Joining the Dots. And it's on our website. It's on the Forensics for Justice website. And ironically, after issuing that report, the then head of the uh, Hawks, a guy by the name of Nclemeza, um, who, you know, they charged me, I don't know how many charges by that stage, they wanted to charge me with more charges. They wanted to charge me with espionage. So, so in December 2016, I issued that report. In December 2016, while I was in London, they opened a case against me for espionage. And they accused me of trying to uh, cause an Arab Spring revolt in South Africa, trying to undermine and overthrow the government. They accused me of acting together with Robert McBride, um, the DA, and AFRI Forum, which of course was absolute rubbish. They said that I had a planning meeting on the 3rd of December 2016 at a house in Bedford View, and they said that at this meeting were those uh, people. Meanwhile, it wasn't a meeting, it was a braai. It was a Christmas braai. I was flying to London that evening, and I was having a braai, and I was handing over to Robert McBride a copy of the report I'd produced. 
Uh, now, I produced that report in uh, concert, if you like, with AfriForum, but the report was my work. And it was published by AfriForum because AfriForum wanted to show what was going on in the police, the prosecution service, and the links with the media and how rotten media had assisted to bring the country to its knees. Now, it's sad for me that the Sondo Commission does, has taken this decision not to report on the, uh, the criminal justice uh, thread, I think, or stream, work stream, they call it. So they've abandoned the criminal justice work stream because they said it doesn't quite match their original uh, mandate. And that to me is wrong because they allowed a lot of criminals to get into box in Zondo Commission and lie through their teeth, badmouth me, badmouth Robert McBride, badmouth a whole lot of other people, Johan Boysen included, uh, and others. And those people never had a right to reply, by the way. We, we, we didn't. I applied to go and cross-examine mm. these criminals and I was told to get lost. And I, the, my question is, well, why did you allow them to badmouth me in the first place? And from a position of privilege, you can't sue somebody for giving evidence in the Sondo Commission because it's deemed to be a position of privilege. Paul, before we finish off, in the last few days, two of the star witnesses of the, on the other side of state capture, the people who were badly affected by state capture, Temba Maseko and Johan von Lochrenberg, both had invasions, home invasions, or attempted home attempted, invasions. Attempted burglaries. You know this world well. What's yeah. going on there? Well, I mean, look at the rate of crime out there at the moment. So it could be just normal crime. Abs you know, until there's some... It's very easy to say there's reds under the bed. Um, and of course, why would they be immune to... But why would they both be hit... On the same okay, night. But why would they... They weren't hit on the same night. Well, within, within a, a couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, in, you know what? It could be linked. It might not be linked. And it's very easy to jump to conclusions. And I think what should happen is a proper investigation, which is very hard these days, with the police and the prosecution service working the way they are, a proper investigation to reveal who was involved you know, if one turns the clock back, the offices of the Helen Sussman Foundation mm -hmm. uh, were robbed in 2016 and all their computers stolen. The investigation never discovered who was behind it. The problem we have in South Africa today... But 2016 investigators would yes. have been somewhat different to what yes, you would have yes, today. Yes, yes, yes. I'm just wondering, the all, all the evidence is out there now. There's no more evidence to be put on the table. It's there at the Sondo Commission. All that evidence has been done. The only other place that evidence can be led now is in a court of law when these people are on trial. So what, what, even if they got there and stole it, what are they stealing? They're stealing copies. The originals are all safely stored away. I just don't see the motive for a house burglary unless they were planning to steal something, you know, like a TV or something like that. That's not to say it wasn't linked, but... Uh, I'm a factual person, you know, being an engineer, I'm, I'm a, I take a scientific approach and I never like to say, speculate, shall we say. And one can't speculate until you have some evidence and then you're not speculating, you're talking about facts. So factually, it's very suspicious. There's no doubt about that. Um, but at the moment, that's all it is, very suspicious.